evening. Welcome to Vibrant Hong Kong. I'm Mishi. I'm Rico. Good evening. Rico, I know that you do a bit of cooking every now and then. Do you ever wonder where your ingredients come from? That's a good question, Mishi. I do make a point of reading the labels, but I must admit that I don't usually get around to it until I'm at home because I'm often in a rush when shopping for groceries. I can totally relate to that. We live in a developed city where the majority of our food is imported. Most people aren't aware of the origins of what they're eating, let alone issues such as food shortage and insecurity. With the intensification of global warming, natural disasters caused by extreme weather events have become increasingly frequent. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the world has lost about 75% of its crop biodiversity since the beginning of the last century. For the welfare of humanity and to prevent certain crops from becoming extinct due to regional or global catastrophes, seed banks have been established worldwide. There are currently over 1,000 seed banks around the globe dedicated to the collection and preservation of seed samples. One of them actually exists right here in Hong Kong. Let's take a look. Don't underestimate this tiny seed. The fruits and vegetables we eat every day are all grown from one of these. Seeds are a source of food and play a vital role in ensuring the well-being and survival of the human race. That is why they must be protected at all costs. This is the seed bag, right? Yes. Here is our seed solid. There are so many different containers. They belong to a different species. So Michelle, I know we're mm -hmm. at the seed bank. How many varieties are there? In there, we now have 461 seeds in here, including some commonly found fruits and also vegetables. Now, I see that there are different numbers indicating in terms of temperature. Do the seeds have to have specific conditions when being kept? Well, the seed in here is stored for short-term purpose. It will keep at 5 to 8 Celsius degrees, and also in particular humidity. You have so many seeds here, 461, right? Yeah. What are they used for? They are mainly used for testing, for gaining the information of the seed, and also we will distribute the seed to farmers and also public. Once we found it, it is in good quality. Seeds need to be treated before they can be stored in a seed bank. Today I'm going to intern here as a researcher and learn how to prepare samples for storage. For the new of five seed, we will calculate its number and then we will go through a bunch of different tests, including the viability test, heat spread treatment, drought treatment, and also germination tests before it enters in our seed bed. Michelle, can you mm -hmm. tell me the process of what we're going to do today? Mm -hmm. Today we are going to do the viability test. Um, there is already pre-soaked winter melon seed, mm -hmm. so your job is to help me to remove the seed coat and okay. turn it to the white seed inside. We then will use the tetrasolium chloride solution to dye them into different colors. Our goal is to observe the color change and to determine the viability. If the seed is more red, it's a good seed, uh -huh. but if it didn't change the color, which means oh. it cannot germinate well. So after two hours, this is a result. How would you rate this batch? Mm, you can see the color is not red enough, and some of them even don't have any dye on it. So I will rate this as not very satisfactory. Okay. And for this bunch of seed, we will not pass it to the public and farmer. Apart from preserving the past, SeedTech is also sowing the seeds for the future of Hong Kong's agricultural industry. Hong Kong was actually a prolific rice producer in the 1950s, but the cultivation of this grain eventually declined due to economic transformation. Fortunately, Professor Lam Hon Ming recovered the seeds of two local rice varieties from a seed bank and successfully generated a genetic ID for them last year. Today, he's giving me a tour of the net house at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. This simi was once upon a time a gift from the people here to the emperor in palace. Very interesting. And what are the ones behind us? Uh, this is uh, called Fa Yu Jin. This is a variety very similar to Fa Yu Zhang, but they are not the same. Right? The DNA tells us that they are actually different. And I see a lot of plants around. How many varieties of rice is being grown here? 
There are seven varieties in this growing season. Those are all um, varieties that has been grown in Hong Kong 100 years ago. So the rice here, what do you do with the harvest? Well, first, of course, we will do research. And you also distribute it to farmers, especially those in small farms. And in addition, we also uh, share the seeds with the students who would like to grow rice in their schools. A curiosity, how many farms in Hong Kong are currently growing rice varieties? In last growing seasons, there's about 10 to 11 farms growing rice successfully. Actually, they make some a little profit by selling them. Agriculture isn't a focus of Hong Kong economics. Can you share your purpose of helping rice cultivation in Hong Kong? Rice growing is part of Hong Kong history, connecting us to the history. Mm -hmm. Second is to connect the customer from farm to table, rather than from supermarket to table. Although agriculture is a sunset industry in Hong Kong, and many posts have already been replaced by AI, a group of scientists are silently striving to preserve the historical and cultural roots of our city. Seed banks are like the planned version of Noah's Ark. They can help extend the viability of seeds and may very well become a lifeline for humanity in the future. While the preservation of existing seeds is vital, the R&D of new crop varieties is equally important when it comes to agricultural development. We're delighted to have Professor Lam Ho Ming with us to share the fruits of his research in agricultural innovation. Welcome, Professor Lam. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being on our show, Professor Lam. Now, I know that you successfully developed a salt and drought tolerant soybean in 2016, which is now being grown around the world. Speaking of soybeans, I also understand that you recently took a group of secondary students to Gansu province to visit some soybean farms. Can you tell us more about this trip? Okay, so this is a highly packed trip. And we visit um, the uh, Agricultural Museum in Yangning in Shanxi provinces. And then we visited the Gansu Academy of Agricultural Sciences in Nanzhou and the National Water Saving Station in Wuwei. And then visit two agricultural fields growing my soybean in Zhangye and also Jiuquan. This is a trip to broaden the horizon of our high school students, let them know the agriculture and food security better, and also see how the Hong Kong research can be applied to Gansu provinces. Well, I'm sure they've also gained a deeper understanding and insights into soybean and agriculture. I'm curious to know how many acres of land in the mainland are currently allotted to planting the salt and drought tolerant soybeans that you have developed and where are they mainly grown? So the cumulative acreage of our seeds has uh, reached uh, 53,000 hectares, around 50,000 football field. It has been grown across 2,000 kilometers on the lowest highland in Gansu provinces. In, in the east, this is uh, starting from Qingyang uh, County and all the way to Jiuquan. So this is a very um, extensive growth in di with different uh, growing spots. It's actually way more extensive than we expected. Now, Professor Lam, you've been studying soybeans for over 20 years, and you developed um, three varieties of salt and drought-tolerant soybeans. Can you tell us about each um, variety and what are the unique characteristics? In collaboration with um, breeders in China, we actually developed three soybeans for human consumption and one for animals. So for the one for human consumption, one of them are very good in food properties. So food company liked it very much, the protein and also the appearance. And the another one is very good for uh, growing in high altitudes. In high altitudes, the temperature is lower. So one of them can grow as high as uh, 2100 meter altitude. And the third one is more exciting because it can adapt to different environments. It has both uh, draft tolerance property and also torrents to flooding. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you get a very dry season followed by high, heavy rain and both will kill the crops but our variety can survive in both conditions. Well, it looks like the soybeans can survive in more places than me. I feel quite inadequate as a human being. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I'm, I want to know, like going back to the beginning, why did you decide to study soybeans and what special properties do they possess? Because I heard that planting them actually benefit the environment of the soil. So one is the importance in food security. So soybean provide the world's, 70% uh, of the world's uh, vegetable protein 
and 28% of the world vegetable oil. So it's very important as a protein source for, especially for those uh, uh, people who cannot afford meat. Right? And soybean also has a special property of uh, fixing the live children from the air and turn it into amino acids through the symbiosis with a bacteria in the soil. So it's environmental friendly. So when, when you grow soybean, you actually get an organic nitrogen into the soil to save the use of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. The third importance is, is related to something since sentimental. Soybeans are, are were originated from China. Before Han Dynasty, soybean has been one of the staple food uh, in our culture. After Han Dynasty, we eat rice and noodle, and soybean become an uh, important uh, ingredient in the food chain, like the soy sauce, tofu, soy milk, fermented soy, uh, soybean, etc. So, I mean, I personally is a big fan of soy products, but I never understood or know the significance of it. So I actually have new admiration for it. Now, I would like to follow up and ask, what's the ultimate goal that you hope to achieve with this process and the research? Well, I, I guess uh, first um, we want to develop some environmental friendly agricultural method and products so that uh, we can help the farmer to increase their income as well as protecting their variable soil. And also for this uh, research, we want to educate uh, the Hong Kong students that science can be very important for humanity. And scientists, in addition to earn money, <laughs> make profit, we can also contribute to uh, people's life. Yeah, I mean, what, what you guys are doing right now, it's like such a great thing for humanity. So aside from Asia, I understand that the soybeans that you develop are also being grown in South Africa and Pakistan. How did these projects come about and what's their current progress? Okay, so um, actually the Africa project come first. So I visited South Africa a few times and uh, I make friends there and they show interest to grow soybeans in South Africa. Actually, um, the representative of the chief said they can lend me 20 hectares of land, okay? And the friends in South Africa has made up a Zulu name for the project. The, in, in Zulu, the like, African language, in Beu, Yetimba. <laughs> so this Zulu means uh, uh, seeds of hope. Aww, uh, so so, so they, they believe that uh, our seeds may bring some hope to the religious there to increase their income and, and reduce some of this um, uh, problem of unemployment of the youngsters. Another exciting news is uh, two years ago, um, we have started to grow some soybean in Pakistan. Right. Yeah, uh, in a region with very high temperature. So one of my uh, previous postdoc uh, who studied in my lab, who is a, also a Pakistan uh, citizen, returned to uh, Punjab. And he, he grew our seeds in, in that provinces. And in the year, year 2022, uh, the field temperature has reached 40 to 45 degrees. And he told me that all their soybean died, but our soybean, some of them can survive. A couple of weeks later, uh, it reached 40 again in, in that particular area. Uh, but my um, previous postdoc said, don't worry. He said, your beans still survive and get seeds. And after harvesting this season, he's going to um, distribute it to more farmers. They have some uh, good local variety that cannot withstand high heat, and yet they can uh, resist to local disease. So I said we can do a breeding for them so that they get double benefits. And I, I promise also to train the students to how to do breeding. So in the future, uh, they can do their own. Yeah, I mean, congratulations. Just looking at all the photos, you could tell, you know, all the greens, you know, like the soil is very healthy and everything is going well. So we look forward to more good news from you in the near future. Well, I think your stories from traveling abroad are beautiful. You're literally spreading the seed of hope around the world. As if going international wasn't impressive enough, Professor Lam's soybeans were delivered to Tiangong Space Station in May this year. And this was a major breakthrough in space agriculture technology for Hong Kong. So what was the objective of sending your soybeans into space and how important is it to national agricultural development? So in a space condition, there are microgravity conditions and they may have um, experienced some unique uh, radiations in the space. How will it change the genome 
of the soybean and as well as the bacteria that's so important for them. If they get a unique modification of the genome that we cannot make it on the earth, maybe you can use it right, to make better uh, soybean who can, which can grow in more area or better mysobium that can fix nitrogen better with soybean. So there's an immediate uh, application. Another uh, important application is in the future, when human want to travel in space or building space station, we need to grow our own food and we need to have our own soil with the right bacteria growing the right plant. So what kind of changes? In during the space travel, we need to find first, find out first, right? So that was like more a scientific questions. What kind of genomic changes that were brought about by microgravity or, and also some of the special radiations in the space? Wow, it's not only about expanding the understanding of soybeans and agriculture, it's also expanding our appetite. And we're actually reaching, you know, food from both space and land. And I'm sure that, you know, really broadens our options. Yeah, it's like a connection between land and space. Who would have thought, right? Exactly. <laughs> now, Professor Lam, I know that you're not only an expert in soybeans, you're also dedicated to the restoration of local rice cultivation. Now, I understand that you and your team conducted bioinformatics analysis on two local rice varieties that have been lost to Hong Kong until recently. Can you please tell us the objective of this project? So um, rice has been a very popular crop in Hong Kong for many, many years since Song Dynasty. Uh, the cultivated rice get distinguished around the late 80s when the new satellite town rapidly developed. So they take out all the lands that we used to grow rice. We cannot find any viable local seed varieties uh, in Hong Kong. So I, I go to search in the National Seed Bank and we find that they exist in the United States at the USDA Seed Bank. So I, I get the seed back. So we sequence the whole genome of these uh, two rices and compare to 3,000 different rices in the world and find their uniqueness. And we develop six markers for each variety. So for the, for the sapphire yodai and also for the, for the sea meal. With six markers, we can identify this is the rice from Hong Kong. We grow those rice because it's not just for production for food, but it's a connection to the history. So the rice seeds represent part of Hong Kong history. And the rice also represent the, the beginning of the food chain. So our youngsters go to supermarket and buy rice, I think, the rice are from supermarket, <laughs> but that, that's not true, right? It, it's the farmer and the soil that bring, bring the food to us. So it's, it's of very important value, not just for production, but also for, the, for bringing the customer closer to our food and respect the farmer, respect the land and respect the, the, the food. And thanks to you and your team, some long lost local rice varieties have reappeared on our tables and I can't wait to find out what they taste like. Apart from Professor Lam, there are many more scientists in Hong Kong who have been working tirelessly in their respective fields. The Future Science Prize is a highly respected annual award that recognizes scientists and researchers who have made outstanding scientific achievements in the mainland, Hong Kong, Macau and Taiwan, so as to encourage more young talents to devote themselves to science. Initiated in 2016, the Future Science Prize consists of three categories. Life Science, Physical Science, and Mathematics and Computer Science. This year, the laureates were announced at a press conference held simultaneously in Hong Kong and Beijing via live streaming. The aim is to demonstrate to the world of the importance of scientific work which was done in mainland China, Hong Kong, Macau and Taiwan and to showcase the world how such impact can be made to benefit mankind. I think one of the um, features is to basically show the scientists that we appreciate their work, and secondly, is to showcase the work to the public, especially the younger generation, to show them that actually science is a cr critical part of our future, and to attract some of the young people to go into science. 2023 Future Science Prize, Life Science Prize is awarded to Ji Jie Chai and Jian Ming Zhou. 2023 Future Science Prize, Physical Science Prize is awarded to Zhao Zhongxian, Chen Xianhui. 
2023 Future Science Prize, Mathematics and Computer Science Prize. This is awarded to He Kaiming, Sun Jian, Ren Shaoqing, Zhang Xiangyu. Promising young talent were among the eight scientists honored with the accolade, a testament that the establishment of the Future Science Prize has spurred scientists in the Greater China region to contribute to the progress of humanity through their research. I think the attraction to the younger generation is especially prominent this year when we have a number of winners who were born uh, in the 80s or even in 90s. And this will show the young people that if you work hard, if you have inspiration, then actually you can change the world even when you're young. Secretary for Innovation, Technology and Industry, Professor Sun Dong, was also invited to deliver a speech at the press conference. Meanwhile, the 2023 Future Science Prize Week will be held in Hong Kong later this year, bringing the brightest scientific minds from different places together in the city. Yishdao We're over 10 episodes into our show now. Have you gotten used to our virtual set yet? Well, it's practically my home away from home at this point. I really love all the neon signs hanging in the background as they highlight one of the most iconic aspects of our city. Colorful neon signs are indeed an essential part of Hong Kong culture, with renowned local director Wong Kao Wai being especially fond of using them to tell stories. They first emerged in Hong Kong in the 1960s and served as a means for large corporations and restaurants to promote their brands in the pre-internet era. While neon signs played a crucial role in shaping Hong Kong's unique cityscape, they've been gradually disappearing from our streets with the popularization of the internet and changes in advertising trends. An organization committed to the preservation of neon signs is holding an exhibition to shine a light on their brilliance and ingenuity. Let's take a look. exhibition at Taikun showcases many fabulous neon signs that were rescued by the organizer moments before they were dismantled. And that is the whole art form of neon, which in the hands of Hong Kong's unique craftsmen and master tube vendors and calligraphers and painters and sign designers uh, has really established itself as a very distinctive style of visual culture and a very distinctive kind of uh, visual language which I think is associated with uh, a very uh, exciting and prosperous period in Hong Kong's history. Once the iconic visual identity of Hong Kong, many neon signs have been removed from our streets due to safety issues. However, we can indulge ourselves in their radiant romanticism once again through this unique collection. City. Hong Kong's night views are a must-see for anyone visiting the city as they offer a unique glimpse into the vibrant and dynamic culture of this global metropolis. 
Absolutely. When I was little, I was amazed by the size and colorful designs of the neon signs lining our streets. Their spark and romanticism are a vital part of Hong Kong's visual image. Tonight, we've invited a very special guest to share the story of Hong Kong's neon signs with us. Please welcome Ms. Cardin Chan, General Manager of Tetra Neon Exchange. Thank you for being on our show. Thank you so much for having us. So lovely to meet you, Cardin. I guess um, I would like to ask you the most obvious question. What inspired you to set up the organization and focus on the conservation of Hong Kong's neon culture? I grew up in the 80s and 90s in Hong Kong. And then I, I remember I was actually privileged enough to be showered by the full streets of like Hong Kong neon signs. And then the warm glow um, actually reminds me of a sense of home and hope. When I was living overseas, uh, I realized something that actually made me feel very ashamed. Uh, because for the longest time, I did actually take what my lovely city has to offer uh, for granted. Like a lot of people, myself included, uh, I always thought neon signs uh, would be able to stay forever. And then so when I actually relocated myself back to Hong Kong in 2017, I, I, just, I just thought like without knowing exactly what I would like to do, I would like to see how I could contribute like my little efforts to um, Hong Kong local culture. And then one night I could not actually sleep. And then I was scrolling down on my Facebook page and I saw an article uh, about like a Facebook group set up by a Westerner living in Hong Kong at that time, uh, talking about uh, saving Hong Kong neon signs. And I realized I th something inside me was like, I need to actually contact that person. And then I did the next day. And then I started my journey as a volunteer, um, what neon was about, uh, how I, we could actually like, as, a, as someone so ordinary like myself as well, how we could actually, um, I, think of ways to support this uh, disappearing industry. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, that, that, that's another heartbreaking fact that actually make me extra determined because I realized these people, um, they sacrifice so much, but all they ask is so little. And then also at the same time, I think for decades, they never actually got the recognition that they well deserved. So to me, um, it's my, it's my honor to be able to actually give them a platform uh, so that actually public would actually have a chance to actually understand what these people's lives have been and how much they have really contributed to Hong Kong. Well, I mean, firstly, we admire your perseverance. It's not okay. easy, and you're definitely not ordinary because you turn your <laughs> thoughts into action and you made things happen. Exactly, <laughs> and you. I totally agree with you. As someone who grew up in Hong Kong, I've always been so proud of our neon signs. You know, it's the very feature that drew Hollywood film directors to Hong Kong and exactly. picked this place as a, a film location. But many of us actually overlook these beautiful details mm. of our city. So can you tell us more about the neon culture in Hong Kong and how does it differ from its counterparts um, in other parts of the world? Mm. Based on the research that we, we have been doing, uh, Hong Kong neon signs actually inherited a lot of like cultural elements or from like old China as well. Like Chinese, handwritten Chinese calligraphy plays a big part in Hong Kong neon signs as well. And then so to us, for the longest times, for decades, our streets were just like a living gallery. When you took a trip on the on the double tacker bus, like the topless one, you could actually see it was just like a, it was magical, if you ask me. You could actually appreciate all sorts of like Chinese calligraphy types as well. Hong Kong neon signs actually preserve like a lot of hidden messages uh, that used to be very prominent in um, traditional Chinese visual language. For example, um, one of our signs uh, at the exhibition is a, is a koi, you know, the fish, uh, jumping out from water mm. with a gold coin in his mouth. Uh, to us, it's like Lei Yuk Long mm. um, It actually, it actually um, uh, symbolizes like a, a, a carp uh, jumping through the dragon gate, which means, or which actually like uh, carries uh, a wish uh, that person, that owner actually owns the store, would be able to climb a social ladder mm. 
mm. of course, and also wealth. Level. Yes, wealth as well. Mm -hmm. And also, like, uh, it's very it's very usual for us to see, for example, like double happiness or even quadruple happiness in logos um, uh, uh, for some of the Hong Kong neon signs as well, or Hong Kong like a, a lot of uh, business logos as well. Well, Cardin, these neon signs are just breathtaking to behold. Can you tell us more about this exhibition at Tycoon? Uh, first of all, it's a wonderful and meaningful uh, collaborative effort uh, because Tycoon is all about Hong Kong stories, art and heritage, exactly what Hong Kong Neon is about. So to me, it's a match made uh, in heaven. Uh, thanks to Tycoon this time, uh, their support actually enable us to um, uh, restore uh, repair and then exhibits like some of the signs that we actually preserved or saved uh, uh, and also like it actually gives us like the first ever opportunity to allow public to appreciate the neon signs on ground level and up close. You're right. Uh, can you tell us about the word phyto signs? Like, why is it called phyto signs? Uh, even though I'm the curator of the exhibition, we actually worked with Tycoon very closely every step of the way, especially the director of Tycoon Art, Mr. Timothy Kelnan. When we were sharing the stories of like us saving the Hong Kong neon signs and why, and all of a sudden he was like, I know what the what the, what we are going to name our exhibition. We should call it Phyto Signs because of it's a word play, right? Right. I love the innuendo. Yes, and then at the same time, we actually talked about what Vital Signs are, why they are so vital, and then also the vital businesses and their stories behind these Vital Signs. And we call them Vital Signs because it is basically in our DNA, mm -hmm. is in our blood. Without it, we could not actually survive, just like the heartbeat, just like perspiration rate, just like body temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, without it, we would die. Wow, that's a really cool concept, actually. <laughs> Very it. smart as well. <laughs> yes. Now, um, can you share with us some of the standout exhibition pieces with mm -hmm. us and also the stories behind them? Right. I, one of them is like uh, what we call the cat and dog. It actually used to belong to uh, a hardware store. Uh, it looks really like Japanese cutesy. Uh, so at the beginning, we were like, how come a hardware store would have such a cutesy uh, style neon sign? And then the owner actually explained to us that sign actually belongs to um, the former identity, which was like a, a, a store selling uh, of, or specializing uh, Japanese electronic products. So it, it was very Japanese because back in the 90s, I think um, up Blue Street, Sham Po, where the store uh, uh, lo was located, uh, I think it was the answer or the local answer to, to uh, um, the district that is very famous for the electronic product called Akira Bara in Japan. Uh, that's why they follow that trend as well. So it was a, like a very cute seed cat and then on one side and the other one was a, uh, a dog like talking on the phone happily. And then we wanted to feature this piece at the exhibition because we wanted to actually challenge people's preconceptions about Hong Kong neon signs. Because a, a lot of people, especially young people, they, they haven't actually experienced like the sea of like neon signs. They, would, they may actually have this concept like, Oh, Hong Kong neon signs, they are very traditional, very old, very like old fashioned. But it's not the case, it's very versatile. Like you could actually see Chinese calligraphy, you could actually see logos, you could see like um, a different kinds of patterns. And then like, because these days we, under we, we, we also discover the 90s, the trend is coming back. And then like, like so it, it is, it's just, we want people, we, especially young visitors, to be able to experience like, oh, Hong Kong neon signs actually could be presented this way. And then also trends would come and go. My bottom line is if we can't actually keep the craft going, no matter what kind of trends would be coming back, it has nothing to do with us. So that's why like, we want them to actually understand this and then also cherish this together with us. So, Cardin, I heard that there's a six meter high neon sign, mm -hmm. which is also very significant. Mm -hmm. Can you share more about that? This is the biggest one we could actually squeeze in to the, the duplex, um, which is six meter store, as you mentioned. And it belongs to um, an over 80 year old bakery in Yunlong area. I, I remember I follow up on this case for a year, over a year, 
I just look at the design. I actually checked with the contractor or the maker, the sign maker, and as well as the, um, the, the, the sign owner as well. I said, like, can you tell me more about this sign? Uh, first of all, like, if you actually pay attention to the, to the corners, they are all curved. And then it takes, they actually take a lot more work to actually get done. This bakery actually sells or specializes in Chinese pastries, like wife cakes, low pop bang, or like uh, wedding cakes as well. They're all round shapes. That's why the corners are curved. And then also like they actually resembles the traditional kind of Chinese lanterns as well. So just from one side, we could actually see so much um, uh, relevance to the old days. And then I remember um, during the exhibition, we invited the sign owner and then the sign maker to actually come join us at the exhibition. And then upon their re uh, arrival, we actually had the sign off. And then when we were in position, we actually had the sign on, on for them. And I remember seeing the facial expression on the 19-year-old proprietor. I think he was really stunned and he was really touched as well. He said, like, I never thought, like, donating the signs to you, actually, I would, be ab I would live long enough to be able to see it being on again. And then the son actually shared with us, uh, my father still can't actually let it go. The sign actually meant so much to him. And then he, he recalled, like, the father actually... Um, uh, described like how he felt when he had to let go of the sign. Like I can't believe the sign retires before me. So we, it, it, it really like um, uh, it was like a, a boost to our to us because it's not only about saving the sign. It's about telling their story and also like. Uh, their sign would actually bring businesses to them and then to keep the sign going and also the businesses going as well. What a great story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Cardin, I'm sure it's a very satisfying learning process for you, you know, reconnecting with the past. So what are some of the biggest challenges you face in maintaining and preserving neon signs? Oh, lots of challenges. <laughs> Can you uh, tell us a few? Sure, because like uh, we, we have very limited resources and then that's why like we basically work nonstop. Whenever we actually receive like a call telling us or or like some followers sharing with us, oh, I just saw a scaffolding being erected like around this neon sign. Could you please like look into it just in case like they're going to remove it? So we need to actually jump into action no matter that this is like day and night. It's almost like animal rescue. You know, you have to yeah. be on call all the time. We race against time to save both like the tangible assets. But mm -hmm. at the same time, we try to record or document uh, the people stories mm. history at the same time and then like sometimes it's so tiring uh, but I, I actually ask myself a question if because me not reacting or responding uh, quick enough and then the sign actually disappears could I actually live with it my answer is usually no every step of the way think about like what more we could actually do it, we, we, we also, we, we need to actually understand it's not only heritage. We need to actually take it one further step, like how we could actually turn heritage into assets again. And then so to me, it's like what our vital signs are about. Live it, breathe it, support it, preach it, and then transform it. For sure. A collective effort. <laughs> yeah, it's a collective effort. So thank you so much, Cardin, for thank sharing you. your insights with us. We had a good time. Um, <laughs> thanks again for illuminating us on this wonderful feast for the eyes. Vital Signs will be running at Taikun until 3rd of September. So there's still time to catch the exhibition. Don't miss it. <laughs> After learning about Hong Kong's neon culture, we're going to take a look at another event that is just as vibrant and dynamic. The JC Youth Football Academy Summit made its return to Hong Kong after five years. As part of the program, our young local players had the opportunity to pit their skills against the Manchester United Academy U16 team. The Young Red Devils were back in town. The under-16 team from the Manchester United Academy made a comeback after 2018 to participate in a Youth Football Academy Summit organized by the Hong Kong Jockey Club. They stayed for a week during which they not only visited exhibitions and engaged in community service, but also played two friendly matches against local youth teams. Top left, one, 
The scorching sun hung high and behind me is a group of football players preparing for a friendly match. I'm sure the summit is a great opportunity for both visiting squad and Hong Kong local football players to exchange culturally and for football skills as well. Hi Tim and Lucas, what are your expectations for this training and any foreseeable challenges uh, that you see in the coming match? They really, um, we really experienced um, uh, a really professional academy, one of the best academies in the world, um, how they train, um, the attitude um, that they bring to the training and um, the environment that the coaches and the players create. It was a very good opportunity for um, our team to learn from these guys. We want to be a good host for them and to show them what um, Hong Kong culture is like and what Hong Kong football is like. But equally, we want to learn from them, learn from their style of play, their physicality, and hopefully we can translate this to the Hong Kong football as well in the future. The summit also saw the presence of Manchester United legends who came to show their support for the young players. Diego Forlan, the former Uruguayan international and the top scorer of the 2010 World Cup Finals, was a part of the Manchester United team that won the English Premier League in the 2002-2003 season. Forlan later played in Hong Kong and won a Premier League champion medal with local club Kit Chi in 2018 before hanging his boots up. Pleasure to meet you and a welcome back. Thank you very much. Oh, well, uh, we all know that you've played for Kitchi back in uh, 2018 and now that you're back, do you miss Hong Kong for the last year? I miss, yeah, of course, it's good to, you know, to be back. So, yeah, I miss Hong Kong, uh, you know, it was a really time, really nice time with the family and also as a professional player, so I really enjoy it. Hopefully we can see, you know, young players playing and to see how good they are. Do you have any advice or tips for our young players? Just to enjoy, to enjoy, to, to learn and it's, it's a good, it's going to be a very good experience for them, you know. That I think it's a big opportunity for everybody. The exhibition matches is a lively addition to the Happy Hong Kong campaign, which aims to make everyone happy all over the city. Around 13,000 free tickets for the two games are given out to us Hong Konger to have a taste of the charm of the young Red Devil. But it's about having fun and spreading joy. Local Young Gun said they learned a lot from the visiting guests. We, we really saw how um, other players in, top, in the top academy works and I think I hope to bring um, that kind of professionalism and that kind of um, attitude and their spirit of playing back to Hong Kong when I play here. It's great for both our team and also the other team and it's great to compete against the best players in the world. So obviously we want more of these opportunities to compete in Hong Kong and internationally. I would say like their shots are a lot more like powerful and they have a lot more strength than us. We learned a lot of like their technical abilities. We can see like there is a gap between our players and them. But I would say, like, we, even though we lost, we still played a really good game today. From Hong Kong, you see that they have some talent, they have, they're good on the ball, technically well prepared. So I think it's very important in this generation, in, in this age, to check yourself compared to other generations in uh, other countries. <laughs> Towards the end of the tour, the U16 member of Manchester United, along with local young footballers, came together to engage in community service activity alongside Nemanja Vidic. The former Manchester United captain emphasised that being a good professional footballer requires more than just football skills and techniques. If you play in a football team, so you have to socialise with those players. I think this is a definitely a place where you can have your friends, real friends, where they can learn to play and uh, obviously to learn, learn as well to be part of the group. Definitely this program that Man United did with the Jockey Club, it's perfect and I think it's good as well for community that we are here and playing with these kids and uh, show them how football can be good. Yeah, because so for uh, Man U players, I, I like talking to them. Like we know mostly talk about football and stuff like that. 
like um, their life in the UK. For me personally, I, like obviously my dream will of course to go like professionally in football. This is also a very good like, experience for me. The youth team members from both places had the opportunity to broaden their horizon and deepen their appreciation for diversity. Hong Kong, known as the East meets West Centre for International Cultural Exchange, serves as the perfect backdrop for this experience. Stay tuned and I'll bring you more fascinating events happening in the city. In this episode, we took a glimpse into some of Hong Kong's soft strengths, including accomplishments in agriculture innovation and other scientific domains. We also explored our city's unique neon culture. In this fast-paced era, all signs point towards modernization. As important as it is to keep up with the times, I hope that our roots and unique cultural symbols can be preserved as this city undergoes repeated transformation. That's all from us tonight. See you next week. Good night. Good night.